Okay, let's get started. We have 13 students here, now 14. Hi, everyone. Let's have a short review of last week. So on last week's class on Monday, we started our building classes. So Sitearm informed you about a lot of things about building in Second Life. And as you know, we have a building area up above the virtual campus and we teleported there. And as you know, every team has their own space where they can use to build their products and build whatever they want about their project ideas. So uh, we had the first session there. And after the class, we met twice last week. Uh, the other two sessions were on uh, building practices. So uh, the students who joined those classes had a uh, benefit. Uh, because they had the opportunity to, to meet with us and ask their questions. On Thursday, uh, we had a face-to-face -face session in Cha University in the logistics lab, and there were seven students there uh, from different teams. Uh, some of some members of some teams uh, didn't participate, but we had uh, three team members, the members of three teams. Uh, so there we had a face-to-face -face session where Ginger explained uh, and practiced at the same time with you about building. So uh, all the questions were answered. I guess it was a, a very fruitful session and it took like an hour. And on uh, Friday, we also another session where all the teams were expected to uh, join the session. Uh, you had the chance to practice building your products. And as far as I saw, uh, the teams that attended those sessions uh, were the ones who were half through the road, so they almost finished their products. Uh, and uh, the teams that didn't join, uh, so for now we don't know how much you had proceeded. Uh, and I would like to tell you all that this week, uh, by Friday, uh, we would like to see your product demos. So you will be demonstrating your products whatever you build. So we will be together with the faculty team. Um, we will be again on the building area and uh, we want you to present your products. So uh, we know that it's a draft one and some of you may not be totally finished with the products, but um, the teams who have not started building, please hurry up and finish by Friday. So we will also inform you about the timing of that. Uh, so we will have another session uh, to see the product demos. Any questions from last week regarding building? Still during the week, you will have the opportunity to uh, meet with us both in Second Life or in school in the university and you can ask your questions. If you need help, please tell us uh, so that we can uh, just help you with the things that you need. Um, so this is all for last week. So if there are no questions, let's proceed to this week's class. Today, we have a guest speaker. Namara is here with us with, from Ethiopia Island. Um, the students who have already uh, took uh, ISP course, the Virtual Worlds course, already maybe have met with her. So uh, Namara also uh, visited us in our marketing and sustainability course. Uh, so she has a lot of things to say about sustainability, community building, and social value. So we welcome Namara to our class. Uh, and this week she is going to be here explaining you all about uh, our island. And uh, first of all, we will start here in our campus. Uh, we have another area uh, where we demonstrate our sustainability goals and we, we will go there. And uh, she'll be presenting you with her uh, speech. And then we will teleport to uh, the Ethiopia island and we will spend some time there and we will get to know there. We will have a visit there. And uh, so uh, this will be uh, all for this week. So Namara, hello. Welcome to the class. Hello and welcome. And again, thank you for inviting me. Um, today's presentation is going to be in voice and in local chat. Um, I'm using the Speakeasy HUD. It's something I recommend for anyone who's doing a presentation. Um, you just never know uh, who's in your audience. Um, someone might be hard of hearing, deaf, um, or they're not a native language speaker. And so a chat HUD, um, like the Speakeasy HUD, does help make it a little bit easier for everyone. 
I ask that if you have questions um, during um, this presentation, you know, put them in local chat uh, or hold them until the end of my talk or when we um, open up a little bit for questions. And I hope to do that after, um, you know, periodically. Okay. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing the importance of community building, social value, and sustainability in virtual worlds. Um, and we're going to start with some uh, real world sustainability and business and community ideas. Um, before I do, though, um, I would like to know, um, have you gone through the climate change experience here? And if you have, just type a yes uh, in chat. Type a. So I see that some of you have. Wonderful. Wonderful. So real quick um, and just briefly, Okay, so briefly, what were your impressions? I, nothing lengthy, just um, something, you know, short. Did it have an impact on your perspective of climate change? And I ask that, those two questions, largely because um, I'm interested in the effectiveness of the experience. And I'm also interested in pointing out how virtual um, builds like that, like this area here, um, creates value in that it can impact your perspective um, on a subject or topic like climate change, like the sustainability goals that we have out here that were um, established by the United Nations in 2015. So I just thought I'd put that out there. Um, I'm going to continue. Um, commerce is no longer only about earning profits. There is a growing role of non-financial benefit that companies have to deliver to customers and shareholders in today's world. And when I think about that idea of uh, non-financial benefit, okay, that social value, the first thing I think about are cooperatives. Cooperative business, right? It's um, the first thing I think about when considering a viable, replicable, and successful business model. We're talking in a real world context. Um, and that is something that you can carry into virtual worlds. Oops. Uh, OK. So the slide projector, uh, the slide viewer I have up here may be a little small. Let me enlarge this real quick so that everyone can see it easily. Um, I hope that that's better. This talks about a triple bottom line, OK?
right? Succinctly, if you're not familiar with cooperatives, they are people-centered businesses that are value and principle driven with a focus on local communities. They run their business based on what we call a triple bottom line that accounts for people, planet, and profits. And if you look at the slide, okay, you can see that when we're talking about people, we're, we're talking about in a general sense, uh, fair labor practices, okay? We're not exploiting um, the workforce. What is our impact uh, socially on the community that we're located in, all right? Human rights, uh, that would be um, gender rights, um, you know, sexual equality, um, racial, ethnic, religious, all of these aspects when it comes to human rights. Um, and that we have a responsibility in terms of that the cooperative will um, provide. Our environmental impact when we talk about cooperatives, and you can think about this in context of the virtual products that you're creating, okay? Um, I'm just gonna put that in local chat. All right, so just think about these three things, environmental, all right? So in a real world context, we're thinking of air quality, water quality, energy usage, the waste that we produce, all right? Virtually, I think that you can think of many of those things as well, um, because there is a physical aspect to the creation and maintenance of virtual worlds. Economic or profit, right? So we're looking at return on investment, um, you know, the, how many jobs we create in a community, all of these things. I have a membership in um, numerous um, cooperatives across the United States um, and in Europe. Okay. Um, I know that whenever I shop at a retail cooperative, for example, that I'm supporting fair labor practices. I'm investing in uh, a healthy local economy and that the, the business is environmentally responsible. Okay. So when I think about environmentally responsible, I'm thinking about the product packaging, um, the company that makes the product, the supplier that the cooperatives use. I can trust that they're making decisions that are um, environmentally responsible, that are in the best interest of the community, and um, you know everything that I just mentioned. So. Cooperatives have been on the forefront of social or sustainable value creation as well, right? Sustainable value creation um, or social value creation involves structuring all aspects of the core business that, and, and seek to generate economic, social, meaning people and communities, and environmental values simultaneously, the triple bottom line. And it's another way of talking about a triple bottom line. 70% or more of the revenue a cooperative earns remains in the community that they're located in. And if you compare that with multinational businesses in which less than 20% of the revenue stay in communities in which they're located, it's easy to see how cooperatives
contribute to healthy and prosperous communities. In addition to cooperatives, small scale, locally owned businesses create communities that are more prosperous, connected, and generally better off. Right. When we buy from independent, locally owned businesses, a significantly greater portion of the money is then cycled back into the local economy, just like with cooperatives. And those residents that own those businesses tend to stay in those communities. All right. Um, I'm just typing real quick that the people who own and operate those businesses tend to stay in their communities. They don't. Uh, Okay, they don't wander away. So if you think about um, when we participate in virtual environments, as we invest in a virtual environment, we're also um, supporting the community within that environment, right? In a real world context, when you shop locally, you make purchases from people you know, from people that live in your community. Your purchases help improve infrastructure spending in that community, investments in education for that community, and aid for your neighbors who might need it, All right? Farmers markets are also a great way to support local farms, artisans, and local business owners too. Ultimately, all of this strengthens the entire community. In 2008, for the first time in history, the global urban population outnumbered rural populations. The milestone marked the advent of a new uh, urban millennium. And by 2050, it is expected that two thirds of the world's population will be living in urban areas. Okay. This means access to local produce, for example, will be increasingly difficult as small farms continue to shut down. This may mean that at some point, industrial grown produce will be our only choice. The problem with this is that the further from where you live, the food you eat comes from, the more likely it's sprayed with harmful chemicals or made with lots of preservatives and fillers. This is one big reason it's important to support community gardens, local bakeries, artisans in your area, and other local independent businesses for the things you use and need every day. Now, there are many articles, reports, and studies that have been done on this topic. And I share that because Utopia is designed to showcase examples of community development and the things that I've been sharing with you. Small business practices, right? And the cooperative model for business housing, agriculture and governance are also um, things, concepts that Utopia showcases or reflects uh, in the virtual world. So now that you have a real world context, let's talk about things in virtual worlds, you know, particularly these ideas in virtual worlds, specifically Second Life, right? Lately, I've seen a number of articles talking about the climate impact of virtual businesses. Okay, um, and the metaverse. 
Let's talk about the metaverse for just a second. Okay. First, what is the metaverse? <clears throat> the metaverse, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, generally refers to the concept of a highly immersive virtual world where people gather to socialize, play, and work. You may already be aware that the term metaverse was first introduced by Neil Stevenson in his uh, 1992 novel, Snow Crash. As more and more companies see virtual worlds as a business opportunity, a business environment, the metaverse has entered into economic discussions as well. So the, the definition for the metaverse is kind of broadened. It isn't just a network of virtual worlds. It's also beginning to include NFT transactions, Bitcoin and Ethereum transactions, and more that happen in digital environments. The impact of virtual and digital digital activities on climate change are significant when you think of building the computers to facilitate the activity, uh, cooling systems that rely on fossil fuels, um, et cetera. These are just two examples um, of the costs invested in creating virtual environments. Um, however, there are those who believe that the metaverse holds the promise of substantial reductions in overall carbon emissions, whether, they're the through, whether they are through the um, substitution of physical goods with digital goods or replacing real world presence with virtual interactions. The immersive nature of metaverse experiences could also help overcome our behavioral ba barriers when it comes to climate action. All right. Um, Okay, so um, I wanted to put this in real quick. We saw some of this positive impact um, when during the pandemic, when most of the world was staying home to work and our socialization opportunities were, were minimal. Okay. One of the things to consider is that everybody jumped on Zoom but those of us who continued to work in Second Life were not, um, did not feel such a disruption in the way we work okay, or the way we socialize. When you think about Second Life as a business platform for content creators, you'll find a lot of people who are successfully selling their digital products. This is often done with a shop in Second Life plus a marketplace store. Just as a business in a real world context would have a physical location and a website. Okay, so, but they're also, um, OK, 
Yeah, but digital products also include educational products, right? Course curriculum, um, ebooks, right? That can be distributed here, can be marketed here, and someone can purchase on your Amazon store or on your business website or both, okay? Um, using social media. Okay. So using social media, for example, in addition to your website um, to promote your virtual presence and product is important as part of your marketing strategy. Um, here and I'm sure that you, you've taken classes and that you've also talked about how to use um, all of the tools within Second Life, for example, to uh, one, not only create and display your product, but to market it as well. So I'm going to leave that alone. For content creators, linking their social media to Marketplace URL means that a customer does not have to log into Second Life to actually make the purchase, All right? I do this a lot. Okay. Are these ideas so my question for you is are any of these ideas that I've just touched on been incorporated into your product creation? And you can just answer in chat. Great. All right, so some have, some may have and are declining to answer, which is okay, and some may have not. Yeah, right. All right. So, sidearm, I apologize. Um, I don't have a Turkish translator on. I probably should. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> um, do, do you want to just tell me quickly in English for this limited person uh, what your question was, or did you just translate the what I put out there? Ah, super. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. You know, I should put out a, I should put on a translator that might make life a lot easier, but I'm afraid to disrupt. Uh, 
Um, yeah, that, that sounds good. Thank you. And I was kind of hoping that if folks have translators there, it's translating the text in local chat for them. Um, but anyway, let's continue. And um, something that we might not think about, right? is that 95% of people around the world have broadband access, all right? It's um, more like 80% in sub-Saharan areas. Okay, but still, this is a huge, huge audience, okay? Um, a study conducted in 2021 found that 85% of American adults, for example, okay, and I don't know what the statistics are for each country, but in the United States, 85% of American adults own a smartphone. And it's estimated that in 2021, Americans spent over $360 billion dollars purchasing products and services while using mobile devices. There you go. All right, so worldwide, there are approximately 6.84 billion smartphones. All right. And to put that into perspective, that figure accounts for around 85% of the global population. So I will take out what I was going to put in chat because sidearm, thank you, um, put that in there. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I am not laughing because it was totally meant to be funny, but Sanitation, um, having certain conveniences, um, yeah, are are not uh, as prevalent as things like a smartphone. And so I really um, appreciate that you share that and point that out because too often it's too easy um, not to think about. Those the the core necessities compared to some of the other things that are are very popular in the world. Okay. Thank you. So regardless of your physical location, the data does demonstrate that this is a that, that there's a this is a huge audience, and many consumers are browsing websites and making purchases using their smartphone or similar devices. And that's true um, around the world, okay? Now, I started using Second Life in 2008 to expand my, my own client base. Um, I was doing organizational consulting at the time, and my focus was on governance. So I did a lot of board trainings. Right, so I traveled a lot. My real world clients, okay, right, so then there was second one. And I brought my real world clients into Second Life for workshops, for meetings, um, for uh, 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 events, you know, uh, company gatherings, um, even helped them put together some uh, basic conferences for their industry. Um, one client worked on environmental issues and was asked to build a one mile creek restoration project.
Okay, that project was estimated to be about 65 million US dollar to rebuild one mile in a creek restoration project. So I suggested that they do the entire creek restoration virtually here in Second Life. And I worked with them on the mechanics of Second Life and they designed the entire restoration project here. As a result, they were hired to manage the entire real world restoration project. Okay. Another, and there was significant And they have huge cost savings. So while a lot of times we think that creating a product in Second Life is a lot of fun or doing a build is a lot of fun, there are real world implications that are beneficial to the content creator, to the client or customer, um, and to the larger community. So um, I had another client that had board directors throughout the United States and Canada. And the company at the time paid to uh, fly their directors to the US headquarters for quarterly meetings. Right? I suggested meeting in Second Life. Since everyone had computers and internet access, it made sense. Meeting in Second Life is a viable cost-effective alternative to airline costs, hotel costs, and, and other expenses. The work I did with clients to bridge physical and virtual activities became the foundation of se several digital educational products that I created at the time and sold. Okay. Okay, so I put a couple of questions and thank you again, Sidearm, for translating those. Um, I would be interested. Um, yeah. Okay. So there are those of you who are, are processing this uh, on a bigger scale. Thank you. I am um, going to pause and wait a little bit and see if anyone has anything they would like to, to add or if there are questions. Hmm. Okay.
Right. So um, I'm going to to continue so that we can um, make our way to uh, Etopia in a little bit. So in 2020, the Brain Energy Support Team, an organization that provides peer support and education for individuals with brain injury, their families, educators, and professionals, closed their physical offices because of the pandemic. And they now use social media, their websites, Etopia, and the broader or wider Second Life universe for their programs. Great. So it's, it is good to tie your product development to one or more related sustainability goals. Okay. So these sustainability goals are just as applicable to virtual products and the metaverse as they are to physical products and physical communities. All right. Back to the brain energy support team. Right. Their program participants engage in social activities workshops, skills training, and more. It all supports real-world social reintegration after brain injury. Second Life, as you know, is a perfect platform for people to explore and learn about new things in safe environments, like Utopia. I am also a part of the nonprofit Commons. NPC is a great example of using Second Life for improved real world organizational outcomes. We, as leaders in our fields, in our organizations, come together to share ideas and learn from one another. All of these examples along with your own educational experience in Second Life, illustrates some of the many uses of virtual worlds. One of the things that Etopia is doing in partnership with several other regions is to connect our regions together. And we've used waterways to do that. This is similar to what was created with the Blake Sea here in Second Life, if you're familiar with it. Um, it's a great way to create community, to create connections. In real world terms, community connections are facilitated by parks, pedestrians, uh, pedestrian and, and bike friendly spaces rather, and mixed use buildings. The same is true in virtual worlds. It's also about like-minded people coming together. It's also about embracing diversity and people who don't think like us, right? whose values are a little different, but with whom we can have that kind of community discourse. So Etopia Plaza as you'll see when we get there, incorporates 
all of these features, including car, a car-free plaza with bicycles available along with a tram to get around. Throughout the worst of the COVID pandemic, many people talked about how dramatically their lives had changed from working from home to decreased social opportunities. Many people I spoke with felt a sense of loss and isolation. And that may have been true for you or people that you know. Personally, my social activities did not change. Since I spend a lot of time in Second Life because of my work and with friends that I have had for the last 15 years, I have colleagues here that have told me they had the same experience. Okay, that's community. It's also interesting to note that most of the residents of Utopia have been here in Second Life for 10 to 15 years, and a few have been here since Utopia was created in 2007. I share that so that you can better understand that community is created around the value residents derive from being in a place, being there. And this is true for Utopia, and it's true for real-world communities. No, it's okay. Um, so I'm going to um, start, okay, for this tour, I will remain in voice and text. If you have any questions, please put them in chat or again, just hold them um, until we end the tour at the farmer's market, All right? Um, we've had a wonderful opportunity to kind of um, check out different things. When you come to Utopia, um, please interact with our storytellers. Yeah. Um, there are many things to do. Okay. Uh, Almost soon. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to wait for Troy to finish. It's good. It's wonderful. I am so glad that you're all engaging with everything. All right, so I'm going to uh, share a little story with you. Etopia, like all good themed Sims, has a story which I'd like to share with you. Imagine a mining town built on the ignorance and greed of a company that profited from stripping the earth, leaving it barren, and the people who lived there impoverished. As time went on, that community of people came together. They began to embrace a simpler, a healthier, and a more sustainable way to live. Over time and through the generations, a new community evolved that incorporated a way of life that is in balance with nature, mindful of the needs of their neighbors. New ideas are born. Everyone contributes to the sustainability of the community everyone benefits and Troy goes off again okay this story is important because it sets the stage for the experience however Utopia is not a role-play region it's a community of diverse real-world professionals teachers activists advocates, and individuals who want to create a better quality of life for themselves and their communities. 
Okay. Our theme is also important because many communities around the world are dealing with the devastating, the devastation rather, and aftermath of corporate greed. This makes Utopia a dynamic and engaging, ever evolving, and a real place to be. So be sure to stop by the visitor center. Um, I say across the street, but it's right next to us. And you'll find information about activities we have here and Utopia partners. Right. It is our vision of building community that helps us live healthier, maybe even happier lives, and not just virtually. So why does this matter? What are the real world implications? It matters. I'm going to answer it. <laughs> it matters because the world is in crisis. Climate change, peak oil, food justice, water. It, these are all real world threats to our future. Did you know that the fresh water tables we have globally are just about depleted? Those water tables are 40 million years old. And we've depleted them in about 50 years largely due to monocrop agriculture and the need for all that water. Do you know that half an inch of rain falling on a 1,000 square foot roof will yield 300 gallons of water? I don't know what that is metrically. I don't know what it is in terms of metrics, but uh, the metric system. Um, anyway, collecting your own on-site rainwater reduces reliance on potable water for landscaping needs and lessens the demand on underlying groundwater. Aquifers. Okay. This is only one small part of the larger issue of a sustainable future, not just for humanity, but for life, all life on Earth. Raising awareness is an ongoing process. And Utopia allows our residents and our guests to engage in an immersive experience that shares real world options for a sustainable and healthier lifestyle. This is our main landing area. From here, visitors can learn a little about us by chatting with the storytellers, which you did. Right? Storytellers can be found across Utopia. They're on all of our regions. They are non-player characters, if you will, and the Utopian equivalent to posters and information givers. They're also, they can also um, be fun and cheeky, some of them just simply give directions. All right. We also have chests like the one that uh, many of you have found here. They're scattered around the regions. When you click on them, you are asked a question. And when you answer it correctly, you receive a gift. We have several regions, seven of them, six of them now. Um, Etopia Island, where we are now, was founded in 2007 and is our central education showcase. All right, Utopia Prime followed soon after and extends our theme with a farmer's market, an organic vineyard, and a coastal village, and our dance studio, thanks to Samoth, the Sky Dancer. Utopia Quest is our marine life exhibit, and a home, Utopia Homestead is home to many of our residents. Okay. We are also proud to have Peninsula College located in the United States at Utopia Peninsula. The program is run by Zinnia Zauber. All right. Um, 
while education is our main focus, okay, we also support small business development. We have a number of people that understand Second Life is filled with possibility and opportunity. I hope you do too. Right. We have artists that tell their real, that, that sell rather, their real world work in digital form while driving traffic to websites that sell their real or physical items. We have inventors that have developed real world prototypes of things that they also sell in Second Life. Again, raising awareness of their ideas and in some cases driving traffic to their real life businesses. To enrich the experience and learning opportunities around Utopia, we've set up also self-guided tours. You can take one of these the next time you visit. Okay. I hope that you'll come back and take some of those tours as well as discover things that I won't have time to show you today. All right. So we, uh, for example, we have a gondola ride to Eagle Peak, which not only has a terrific view, but a hang gliding station. Okay, we also have trails around the mountain with a few surprises and storytellers, of course. Okay, but for now, Let's go over to our wastewater treatment plant to give you an example of what we are doing there. Okay, please follow me. And if you should get lost at any time, please, I am a classmate or an instructor for a teleport. Please follow me. Okay, as an aside, next door to the treatment plant is the Sustainable Energy Science Lab. So um, that would be, yeah, I believe to the east. Oops, sorry. Uh, to the north, sorry. Okay, um, but you can visit that at, at another time. Um, it is created, it's sponsored um, and maintained by energyteachers.org. And um, we have students that come just to explore the physics uh, and science uh, within Second Life, how that works in Second Life. So our wastewater treatment plant um, is designed to demonstrate current trends in wastewater treatment. And this particular build is a model of a living machine. Now, as I mentioned before, there are storytellers which can be found throughout Utopia. And they are a tool that we use to share information about ecology, solar engineering, peak oil, you know, food equality, organic and healthy living, and so much more. The list just goes on. Just outside, we have a storyteller. His name is Ian, and he knows more about the system than I do. So I'm going to let him tell you about it. We're just going to head 
out um, the south entrance. I'm going to just follow me. We're going to go outside. Okay. So gather as, as close as you can. Okay. So um, I'm just going to read this. He says, hi, I'm an Utopia storyteller. We can be found around Utopia. Uh, some of us can even answer questions. I'm here to ensure the water treatment system works effectively and to tell you about our water treatment plant. Growing trends in green infrastructure allow for creative and environmentally safe designs like what you see here. A living machine mimics a tidal wetland, one of nature's most productive ecosystems. The computer-controlled system treats wastewater in a more energy-efficient and cost-effective way than traditional wastewater plants. Solid settlement tanks are the first step in our process. From various tanks located throughout Utopia, wastewater flows into multiple solid settlement tanks. All solids settle out in the tanks as sludge and are injected with microorganisms to accelerate decomposition. The remaining wastewater flows out of the solid settlement tanks to the equalization tanks. And these are important. By using equalization tanks, we were able to build the smallest facility possible, greatly reducing our carbon footprint. Then the wastewater is brought through two anoxic tanks located underground, just like the solid settlement tanks and the equalization tanks. All right, inside the tanks naturally occurring, he's talking faster than I am, so I'm just going to let him. Okay, uh, we did that. We did Ian's story. Okay, so you can see from this story how what appears to be a simple system uses multiple pathways to ensure water is reclaimed in a safe and natural way. Ian mentioned the mangrove forest, and so let's go take a look. Most people don't really know much about mangroves. Uh, this is back here. Whoop, excuse me. Whoop, sorry. Whoop. So let me just come over on this side by sidearm. Okay. So most people don't really know much about mangroves unless they live in a tropical area that has them. But they really are an important part of the marine, of marine ecosystems. They're found along tropical coastlines with brackish or salty saline waters. Okay, there are so many benefits to mangrove forests, for example, Mangroves trap sediment, okay, making for clearer water. They also absorb excess nutrients from runoff that can cause algae blooms, which deplete the oxygen in the water. Because their roots grow the way that they do, mangroves absorb air through pores on their bark. So when you visit again, you can catch up with Errol, the storyteller here, and he'll share more about mangrove forests. All right, 
Now we'll walk back across the bridge and make a stop at our three sisters garden on the main plaza. Just follow me. Okay, we'll walk around the building. We'll walk through the building actually to the bridge. I missed. Here we are. So we have two storytellers here, and each shares information about companion planting, which is at the heart of this kind of agriculture. Monocropping, or industrial agriculture, leaves plants vulnerable to disease and pests, as well as stripping the soil of all nutrients. That means adding chemical fertilizer and using pesticides and herbicides because there isn't a natural balance. But instead of going on and on, I'm going to let Marnie, another storyteller, tell you a little about this garden. And again, please don't click on the storyteller or it will start over. However, if you click on the sign for the garden, it's in the front of the garden, um, you'll receive the story about Three Sisters Garden and a recipe card. All right, and okay. So All right, so, um, yeah. So we keep clicking the storyteller. So let's head over to the food cooperative just so that we can tie into uh, what we've already talked about. So follow me. Okay.
Okay. I spoke briefly about cooperatives earlier, um, but I wanted to show you this build as an example of what we strive to share throughout all of our regions and what you can do to live more sustainably. All right, so look around a little bit and then we'll circle around uh, to the back plaza. Okay, so we're going to walk this way, down an alleyway, all right, past the art gallery, okay, into our back plaza. Okay. Here we have kiosks for our nonprofit partners. And it's important that we support one another. Okay? It strengthens our wider community by fostering these kinds of relationships. We share information, ideas. Okay? Some of them have gifts. Okay, so you can see here that we've created a walkable community with shops and interactive objects. There is a lot to explore. Okay. You also have a lovely view of Eagle Peak, which is the mountain I mentioned earlier. Okay. So we're going to walk across the plaza over to Serenity Park, and then we'll go to the farmer's market. On the way, you'll see that we'll pass more shops owned by Etopia residents. Okay. Okay, before we go, do you have any questions or comments that you might like to share? And I'm just going to pause here for a minute. And thank you so much, Sidearm, for the help.
If you don't have any questions uh, or comments at the moment, you're welcome. There are gifts everywhere. Um, <laughs> just like storytellers, it's ubiquitous. All right, so um, let's head over to Serenity Park. Okay. Terrific. Okay. So we're just going to head over, just follow me. All right, so Serenity Park is an example of a green space that you can find in most real world cities. These spaces do more than offer a little garden atmosphere, right? Did you know that a simple walk in the park can significantly improve a child's ability to concentrate and ours too? Green views out of school windows or offices correlate with improved academic performance and overall productivity. Children who grow up in greener neighborhoods are often less depressed, they're less stressed, and generally healthier and happier. Okay. By 2050, 68% of the global population will live in cities. I think we've talked about this before. Um, there are more current numbers, I think, that uh, Sidearm shared with us. But Already in Europe, three out of four people live in urban areas. So green spaces are so, so important. All right. Green spaces in cities mitigate the effects of pollution and reduce what is known as the urban heat island effect, which is the heat that gets trapped in built up areas because of all of the concrete um, and metal. Okay? There's nothing to absorb carbon. Um, so planning cities to include green spaces wherever possible really is the first step in making our urban areas healthier. Right? Um, In many ways, I do, Magua. Um, we can't forget that there will always be a, a physical or real world component uh, to our lives. Okay. Okay, I will. Thank you. Um, however, utilizing um, virtual platforms reduces 
the physical uh, impact okay, and climate cost. So So, I, I think in many ways um, that virtual work, play, and life is sustainable, all right? My concerns um, I'm going to do this quick. Um, my concerns are at the moment are that the tech and opportunities are accessible mostly by the elite of the world. Um, by that I mean those um, that can afford it. Okay. All right, so um, my concerns, as, as I mentioned in local chat, are that at the moment the tech, uh, the technology and the uh, accessibility and opportunities related to that are mostly for uh, the elite, you know, those that, that can afford it. Um, and that's why I mentioned broadband, broadband access earlier. I think that it's a portal to what can be done virtually and that we should think about um, I, I hope this makes sense, All right? So when you're thinking about the kinds of virtual products that you're creating, if you are thinking beyond Second Life, okay, beyond this particular platform, but thinking of virtual platforms in a broader sense, I think that we should be creating applications, resources, and products that are available um, via smartphone interfaces, right? So, um, what exactly that looks like, we could probably have another hour or two discussion about, uh, but that's what I'm going to, to say about that at the moment. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I hope that answered your question, Magua. And we're going to head over to the. Okay. Okay.
Okay. I think we've pretty much all made it here. Okay, so welcome to the Utopia Farmers Market. Farmers have been selling their products in local markets for centuries. You probably have a number of these kinds of uh, markets uh, near where you live. Markets like this one are vital for the communities they serve and are a healthy alternative to big box and mainstream grocery stores. Ha here you can get fresh food, local crafts, and it's a space where people can gather and share their stories. Right? Economically, more of the money exchanged at these markets stays in the community, whereas most of the money earned by grocery store chains, particularly, leaves the community and um, yep, leaves the community and the stores that they serve. That's why we have a food cooperative on the main plaza with a storyteller to share more about the value of cooperative business. All the things I mentioned make farmers markets so valuable. If you take a moment, you'll see we have storytellers too. There's also a tiny home exhibit uh, behind me. Um, also across the way is our Utopia Vineyard. It has a restaurant and a wine tasting room. There is much we haven't seen today. So for example, we have a marine exhibit, wetlands, uh, the science lab, which I mentioned, the coastal village with more shops, beaches to visit with friends and more. We also have a wagon ride that will take you to the coastal village where you can enjoy more of what Utopia has to offer visitors and our residents. Okay, you can join our group by clicking on the group joiner sign up by the stage area. All right, the treasure troll next to me is a gift, um, an info giver. If you click on it, you'll get a gift, um, plus a note card about Utopia, landmarks so you can come back often, and my presentation. All right. 